Welcome to another edition of the Brazilian Shirt Name podcast. I'm Dotson Adebayo and I'm based here in London. And Tim, I see you're over there with a suntan. Yeah, and I had a suntan on May the 20th, 1992 in England. Because England was, or London, was having a, a Mediterranean style heat wave. It was glorious. It was fantastic. And that set a perfect scene for the match that we're going to talk about today, which is the European Cup final or Champions League final between Barcelona and Sampdoria, Wembley Stadium, May the 20th, 1992. Yeah, what a cracking match. We're going to talk about it in a moment. But I, I seem to remember this more for the fact that the European Cup, as it was then known, was coming home, as it were, and not quite to us, but at least being staged at Wembley, because we weren't getting them that often. We were banned no, from Europe at this point, weren't we, or previously. It. previously yeah. So it was kind of a comeback, and, and I was at the game. And uh, in comparison with today, I mean, the first thing is, it was just so easy to get tickets. The second thing that I remember vividly from, from being there is that there was just no pomp and ceremony whatsoever. There was no half-hour show from global celebrities beforehand. <laughs> now, I remember when, when we, we've, blimey, we've kicked off. It started, you know. It's so different. And football is just about to change. You know, the 90s is, is, is the decade when it really goes big and goes global and becomes part of the global entertainment industry. We're catching it at this game just on the cusp of that moment, just before that moment. And I actually think this game is the game that launches the Premier League. And I shall explain why. World Cup six years earlier, I remember an interview with the England midfielder, Peter Reid, who was playing for England. Uh, and uh, they were talking about some of the other games. It was a great World Cup. For me, it was probably the last truly great World Cup. But Peter Reid was saying, no, I don't think the fans at home, they, they wouldn't stick for this kind of football. You know, it's, it's, too, it's too slow for them. They, 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 no. He also said, I don't know, this is a part of the interview that you uh. might have missed. He also said that, uh, and the Mersey's version of Sorrow was much better than David Bowie's. With Never your well. long blonde hair and your eyes of blue. You know, you, yeah. said, I don't, you may have missed that part of the interview. But anyway, I did, actually, because you yeah. know what I'm like. Yes. <laughs> With sorrow, anyway. Uh, so, um, roll on six years. And this game, was, had a, it was live on English TV. It had a huge audience. And the reception, I mean, you know, the, the, the papers the day afterwards and so on, was rapturous. And it, it's, it's a very intelligent game. It's a cerebral game. And being there was just amazing. It was amazing. It was certainly, the, in terms of the quality of the play, it was the best game that I'd ever seen in the flesh up to that point. And I haven't seen that many better afterwards. I've been here since 94. Um, the better games I've seen afterwards have been the ones involving national teams because we, the, our club football loses our best players. So the quality of the game was fantastic. And it was it was it was a, a lesson in the value of diagonal passing, the the, the way that space is be is being created. Uh, so it was a very cerebral game, and it kind of set the bar. It showed an English audience that this is what's possible. And nowadays, you can imagine this game being between Man City and Chelsea. It, it's it's not if you look at it now, it's not as foreign and, and exotic as it was in 1992. Uh, and so I, I actually think having this game on English soil kind of paved the way, if you like, for the massive increase in standards of the pitches, of the players, and of the ideas that we've had in the Premier League. It's a really powerful point you make, you know, and I totally get it straight away. Uh, when Even you though you say, disagree on David Bowie's version of Sorrow. <laughs> it's all right, we'll agree to disagree. Can, can we come to the music afterwards? <laughs> yeah, yeah, So yeah. let's talk football first of all. Mm -hmm. uh, now when you explain it in that way, I can see the Premier League in it. When you talk of the cerebral way in which the match was played, I suppose that's not surprising, certainly from the Barcelona end, because this is Johan Cruyff's Barcelona yeah. and they are playing the way that he would play in which he would say that using your head is uh, 
95% of it in terms of football, but you know, your legs can assist you a little bit and all. Um, but the the other side, Sampdoria, do do they match uh Barcelona cerebrally in this match? Well, they're a great side. And remember, at this time, for an English audience, they are the glamour side. Because the English audience, after Italia 90, there's been all the thing about that, that, the World Cup in Italy. And then the Italian football is on Channel 4 with a huge audience at the time. So um, if, if you're into it, you knew the Sampdoria side. They were the glamour side. I happen to know the Barcelona side because there was this cafe that I used to live in. This Italian cafe on Archer Street. Uh, it was called Il Panino which uh, when I worked out, it meant the sandwich. It lost some of its glamour to me, but it was, it was fabulous. Uh, and I just used to live there. Uh, and w- when you walked in, you were in Italy. It was only Italian men and only ever men. And they were watching the football, unless they were watching the cycling or the news or Sabrina videos. That, 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 Sabrina. That, that, yeah. <laughs> Don't you remember Sabrina, the goer from Genoa? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what they were doing. In fact, I can still remember one of the one of the regulars in there just walking around like this saying, football and sex, football and sex. And that, that, that kind of, you know. That, that, that Are you want. sure this is not a stereotype of Italian No, it's men? real. Yeah, it's are you real. sure about honestly, that? It's, it's I, I've seen blokes walk around with Italians doing better. Yeah, yeah. yeah right. Okay, whatever. The owner, the owner yeah. was called Carlo from Cagliari. And the idiot, he lost it. He lost the cafe. Uh, gambling in, in in a casino on the other side of Archer Street. Well, why is he an idiot? He could have won. He lost it. Yeah, because yeah, he, he could have won. He lost his sandwich won, bar. But if he had won, you'd have been saying the genius, the genius. No, he no, gambled he his cafe the house and he won another wins. one. <laughs> the, the house always wins. But it was a fabulous yeah. place, uh, and I used to, used to go go. Uh, I spent a lot of my dying downtime when I wasn't working. I used to go there and watch and watch the football. And I'd watch quite a lot of Barcelona there as well. So I felt really, really primed for this game. I went wearing a Barcelona scarf because uh, I'd been to Barcelona, start of 1990. It was the first foreign city I ever went to. And I was fell in love with it. I've never been back since, much to my regret. And I kind of wanted Barcelona to win. But in a kind of neutral way, you know, I wanted to see a game more, more than, 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 than anything else. So I got in this game, I got everything, everything that I could have wanted. The world, you know, I, I love those London heat waves. When London's like that, I never want, I don't want to be anywhere else in the world. I want to, I want to be spending my afternoons, you know, uh, lounging around in St. James's Park. I know. Putting, me, putting you, my feet in the fountains in Trafalgar Square. And I could really do all of that. And be, we this football as well. You really want to be walking on the beaches, looking at the peaches. Da, da, da. No, it's a bit gross, da, da, da. Really. <laughs> Is it? Yeah. <laughs> That's a bit gross. I don't Is it? Know. Uh, yeah. I, I didn't realise. Okay, well, let me tell you, in 1977, it wasn't grace. gross. It was mm-hmm. because that was a hot summer and all. You know, you might remember that one. And mm-hmm. uh, people thought that was the boom tune to be walking on the beaches, mm-hmm. looking at the beaches. But I was only oh, 17, shit. Really. <laughs> no, 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 that bit. yeah, that bit, that <laughs> bit. Look, this is the radio edit. Why would you have to go there, Tim? There's one word they shouldn't have used, but they were trying to be punkish, you know, outlandish and all of that sort of stuff. I bet they regret it now. Anyway, back to the match. So it's a hot, hot day, 20th of mm. May, 1992. You're at Wembley watching a match and one of the best matches you've ever seen. Mm. Yeah, and it's full of ebbs and flows. Uh, for, uh, it takes a little while to get going. And then first half, Barcelona start to take control. Now, Sampdoria, they've got that up front, the combination of Viali and Mancini, who work wonderfully well together. They've got Lombardo on the wing, you know, the baldy, who's very, very quick. He, he and, was bored then, and he's still bored now, whereas uh, some of the yeah, others... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And they've got this Brazilian midfielder, Toninho Cerezo, who is closer to 40 than 35. Um, but I used to go just, I used to go to this, this Italian cafe to watch him as much as anything else. Uh, and he played the 78 World Cup. He played 82. He'd been injured for 86 and, and had to miss it. But he made a midfield work more than anyone else. He reminded, he, when Veron came along, Sampdoria bought him because he reminded them 
of Sid Ozil. You know, same kind of long leg, a little bit languid, but with a fantastic range of passing. And Barcelona, this is Cruyff at his, mo his, his most pragmatic. They knew the danger of Sid Ozil. So their most dynamic midfielder, a little fella called Baquero, he played on Sid Ozil. And he, just, he marked him out of the game. So the, the, the two of them are having their own, their own little private duel. Uh, and, and so it takes a while for Sampdoria to get going because Cerezo is, is the fella who, who makes the play and he's been marked out of the game. So Barcelona have the best of the first half. Um, what the earliest big chance is a Ronald Koeman free kick uh, that the, the keeper just manages to, to beat out. Second half starts with a flurry of chances for Barcelona. But Sampdoria then have worked them out a little bit. The false nine in the, in the Barcelona side is Laudrup. They've got Stoichkov playing wide on the left. A centre forward, Salinas, playing wide on the right. And they've got Laudrup as a kind of false nine who's creating a lot of problems. But in the second half, they crack down on him. In the second half, Barcelona have one big chance, but it's on the counter-attack when I think it's Stoichkov hits a cross goal and it comes back off the inside of the post. But apart from that, the big chances go to Sampdoria. Because if you look at the Barcelona defence, there's not a lot of defending going on. The, 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 the big centre-back, main centre-back is Koeman, who doesn't defend. He, you know, he's, 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 he's there for his, his, his attacking. He, he's thing. halfway up the, the, yeah. the pitch anyway, yeah. you know, all the time. And the fellow who's just in front of him is our man. Is Guardiola. And uh, it's, it's extraordinary. Um, I went to this game with doubts about Guardiola. Because I'd seen him in the previous round. Is he, is he up to it? Because his role, it, it, he had so much responsibility. He's playing the first ball out of defence, but he's also got all this defensive organisation and covering to do. He's got to do Kuman's job as, as, well as, as well as his own. And he's not quick, Guardiola. Uh, and so there are times when Barcelona are going to get done. And three times in that second half, Viali has a chance. There's one on a cross from Lombardo that he, that he, he, he reaches for and takes an, an over. And there's two when he gets behind the last defender. He's one-on-one -on -one with a goalkeeper. One, he, he hits a little chip across and it's just wide. The other, he blasts and the keeper, Zubi Zaretta, manages to, 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 to push up in the air. That's the moment when, when Sampdoria lose, lose the game. Those three clear chances. Because apart from that, it, it, this is actually the start of my of my journalistic career, really, because I wrote quite a long piece for it for this uh, this fanzine called The Spur, which was for for Tottenham fans. It was quite an upmarket fanzine, and I really enjoyed writing it. I thought, yeah, that, that sounds good. That, that that might be might be an interesting way to to make a living. And Guardiola was one of the ones I picked out because I loved the 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 way that he was taking so much responsibility and organising the, 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 the side from 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 deep. So we go into extra time, and Although I kind of want Barcelona to win, what I really, really don't want is nil-nil and penalties. Because I hate, I hate penalties anyway. I, you know, in order for, for the penalty shootout to end, someone has to be the villain. Someone's got to miss. And I always think that's cruel. Uh, and the game didn't deserve nil-nil and penalties. It was a really good, flowing, flowing game. It was wonderful to watch. But what, I, I felt really privileged to be there as it, as it unfolds on the pitch. So please, 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 can we not have nil-nil? I don't even mind if Sampdoria score. Fine. You know, that, that, that'll do me, you know, but not nil-nil. And then looking at it today, the tackle from in Invenizzi, who's come on in the second half and he's really tightened up the game for Sampdoria in, 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 in the central midfield. The tackle from him, referee blows his whistle. From today's perspective, it's, it's, it's a foul. From the perspective of 1992, it was a, it was a bold decision from the, uh, from the referee. And the Italians, they, they go mad with the protests because they know this is the moment. You know, it's Ronald Koeman stepping up. This is the moment that could decide the game. And all of time stood still. Like that moment when you're waiting for the judge you know, is he going to say guilty or not guilty? You know, time stands still as Ronald Koeman lines up to take the free kick. 
you've got to explain the free kick as well because in a way i mean you're not i'm not blaming the sampdoria uh, first line of defense but they get sucked into a trap and they blind their keeper the, the keeper can't see the ball yeah. to the last point he still almost gets it yeah. you, know, you can imagine if they hadn't run forwards because what um mm-hmm. barcelona do is one of these you know two touch uh, two touches before the free kick. So there are two players with their feet on the ball before Koeman, um runs up to it and they pass it to each other, give each other a one-two and then Kuman goes for it. So in this one-two-three uh, motion, uh, Sampdoria's front line of attack or defence have already rushed forward like those yeah. American, um, you know, NFL guys, you know, when the quarterback's trying to throw the ball kind of thing. So they're almost on Kuman already. But what happens is that Kuman fires the ball between their legs and the, Cooper, uh, the keeper, initially the Sampdoria keeper, goes to his left, whereas the ball's going to his right. It kind of recovers half recovers maybe three quarters recovers and he almost gets the ball but it's uh, it's an excellently worked free kick you know it's uh Kuman is a brilliant free kick taker but when you said earlier about using uh the cerebral um side of the game to beat your opponent it's almost like Muhammad Ali you know he'll go into a ring and sort of use his head first rather than his fist to mm. floor the opponent. And, you know, that classic um, sucker punch on Sonny Liston is a case of using Liston's own weight as yeah. he rushes forward yeah. to floor himself. And he can't see it coming till it's too late. And that's a similar kind of free kick for me. Yeah, and no, I, th- I think you're, you're, you're spot on. Uh, it was funny for me watching it again because in my head, there weren't, there weren't the touches before. I didn't remember that. You know, obviously the old Wembley are quite a long way away, but I just remembered Kuman stepping up for the blast. I'd forgotten those touches and the importance of those touches. But also remember it's hot there. Had those, if that free kick had come earlier in the game, I think that the players running out, they might have just had that extra half a yard and got closer to block it. The fact that it's happening after running around for 120 minutes, I think is decisive. Yeah, Kuman couldn't have known that part though, but sometimes you make your own luck, you know, in terms of timing uh, of a football match. Uh, free kicks and uh, significant moments or transitions have to come. At well, has there times. ever been has there ever been a more important free kick? Because remember, Barcelona at this point have never won the European Cup. It's been a dream ever you since 19, 1955. You can see it on dream. their faces. You can see yeah. on their. I mean, you can see it on Ronald Koeman's face, and he's yeah. Dutch. Let yeah. alone the Spanish yeah. players' faces. It, it was amazing because he was moved to tears, Ronald Kuba, and he starts praying or thanking the Lord as he comes off the pitch. You know, he's doing some kind of like spiritual moment, actually, you know. And the, the thing I loved was because they were playing in these rather horrible orange shirts, oh, grotesque gosh. orange shirts. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, you know, which is, I suppose, a kind of tribute to Holland, and, the, you know, that, that, that's part of it. Yeah. Um, but what do they do to collect the trophy? Take off those flipping orange shirts and put on your proper Barcelona. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. of course. That, that was to. magic. That was yeah. absolute magic yeah. watching that happen. Uh, and uh, I've got such happy memories of the tube ride back into town um, with all the, 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 because the fans could hardly believe it. You know, it, it, it was almost like being a Leicester City fan in 2016. The world can end now. You know, we, we've done it all. The, the, the world can end. And, and, and they, they were so happy. And there's that story I've told so many, many times. I went back into town, into uh, a bar on Old Compton Street, which used to be called Bar Sol Owner. Yeah, uh, I get it. It, was, it was a little dive. It was, it was great. I, I spent most of my summer being there. And uh, I mean, I'm still with my Barcelona scarf. And there's this bloke who, who I could see wants to speak football. He's with his he's with, he's with his girlfriend. I can see there he wants go. to speak there football. It's a yeah, good you've story. heard this. Yeah, I know, I know but it's I know, a good one. Yeah, run it once more. And he Come on. he kind of he, he he's edging towards me. And in the end, he yeah, all right, I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna. So he says, "I'm really glad you won," and I kind of nod, stringing him along, you know. And he says, 
I support West Ham. Have you heard of West Ham? And I suppose the tan must have done him a little bit, you know, not only the Barcelona skirt, you know, scarf, but the, the tan had, had done him a little bit. It had, had fooled him. And I said, oh, yeah, mate, I'm a Tottenham fan. And he falls on the floor. And there's these people watching and it just generates conversations. And that night after, I mean, I got talking to this, this Spanish girl and I remember walking her to the night bus thing at, uh, at Trafalgar Square. You're such a gentleman. I, I, yeah, I get it. Yeah, I get yeah, you yeah. are, mate. But, but I remember feeling a bit like, you know. I, I was a Gable gentleman with... one night, by the way. <laughs> I'm feeling like Clark Gable with Sophia Loren in, uh, in uh, it started in Naples or something like that. So, you know, because England had become Naples or, or Barcelona. It was great. If it was like, if England was like that all the time, I'd never have left. Well, it can be like that all the time. And you can form your own group of... Uh, but you can't have the weather well, like that. You just can't No, you can't it. have the weather. But, you know, with this global warming, you never know. Anyway, I'm not, I'm not advocating it, please. <laughs> Sometimes on the Brazilian Show No Podcast, we throw one and two <laughs> jokes. I've thrown a couple in the last <laughs> couple of minutes. Don't take it personally. Okay, so and it, th- th- there's more significance to this as well, because you, you said... Um, Well, a couple of things. First of all, this is the old European Cup. This is the Mm. last hurrah for the old European Cup. You can see, uh, I mean, looking at it in retrospect with today's eyes, you can see how vast the ocean is between what was the European Cup then and what is the glamour of the Champions League now. Just everything. You mentioned it in the beginning. There isn't the razzmatazz of the Champions League. Okay, you don't necessarily need that as a football fan. But what I always feel a little bit upset about, or not so much upset, but just a little bit um, uneasy about, is that, and I know compared to previous generations, this generation of footballers aren't suffering. You know, they are getting paid a wedge, but their their, uh, talents, the spectacle hasn't been maximised enough. I mean, you talked, when you started talking about the going into town on public transport with the uh, Barcelona fans, and you said, you know, they just couldn't believe, I I thought you were talking about, they couldn't believe the spectacle that they witnessed. And that would be the same for the Sampdoria fans who lost and so on. It's about the spectacle for me. And now when you go to a Champions League final, at least when you see it on TV, because I've never been to a final myself, it does feel as if, you know, with all the music and all that nonsense that you think, oh my goodness, you know, I've been sucked into this, haven't I? But it does feel as if there is some... uh, gravitas about it nowadays whereas then... you know the, the the final of the Copa Libertadores towards the end of last year um, they asked FIFA the organisers asked FIFA if they could have a 25 minute half time to have a, a, a kind of uh, American style show at half time um, you know unthinkable but, and luckily but, they said no you can't do yeah. it it's going to it's going to ruin in the, the game. future but in the future I wonder yeah I wonder and I worry um I, I, I think you move with the times. I, I, I think um, football is a game of flux. No, I, I, I think I, I plant I, my flag. No, you, you <laughs> should. Oh, there needs to be resistance. Your flag will stay firm in there until it is no longer uh, tenable, you know. Uh, and then we have to accept, well, football has moved on. But the point I was trying to make, I just love the way that you linked this match with uh, the emergence of the Premier League mm. as such. So if we say this is one of the greater matches or the greatest matches ever played, certainly finals, uh, Champions League, European finals. What did it have that the others don't or don't always have? Um, What did it have? Is it the cerebral thinking? Well, remember that a few weeks afterwards... The tactics, maybe? A few weeks afterwards... England went to Euros, the Euro 92, and just stunk the place out. Uh, you know, the, the, that conventional 4 4 2 straight lines. What you had here was the creation of space, the ball move, being moved diagonally. Uh, 
in a way that English football just wasn't wasn't thinking in terms of in, in English, English football had become. Remember, English football, as, as you said, it, it had been out of Europe, and and a lot of them were just playing very very unimaginative four four two. So, a, an even bigger difference to me than the quality of the players is the quality of the ideas. How are we going to open up space? And if you look at the Barcelona team, when effectively, I suppose the centre-backs would be, would be Koeman and Guardiola. It's absurd. <laughs> but you could do it that way because you had the ball more than the, the, the opposition did. Uh, and you're continually pushing them around because you're opening up space. And if you look at the players who play in, in this game, uh, Guardiola coaches in England. Mancini coached in England you know, with, with, with some success. Viali coached in England with less success. Koeman with, with less success, but, he, but, he, but he, he coached in England. So on the people who are, who are passing through this game are picking up a wealth of ideas that then that they can then take on with their with their coaching career. And when it was only two years earlier that Aston Villa appointed the coach of the then Czechoslovakia, Dr. Venglos, after that World Cup, Villa appointed Venglos to be their coach. And it never worked because the players just took the piss out of his accent. Now the, the English players at that point, the British players, they weren't they weren't ready. They weren't prepared yeah, sure. to accept a foreign coach. Yeah. You fast forward a few years later, and then it becomes hard for, for an English coach to get in the game mm. because the foreigners have then come in and they've shown, you look at the results, they've shown that they can do things better. So the, 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 it, was, it was, and this was the thing that really struck me about the game, the ideas, and especially watching Barcelona pass the ball diagonally. Because in, in, in the way that England were playing 4-4-2, there wasn't a lot of space for there wasn't a lot of scope for that because the players weren't weren't positioned on the field in a way that there was a diagonal relationship between them. It was all it was all straight, it was all straight lines. Uh, there's one, there's there's a, a one-two that Barcelona played, a huge one-two. It's one of the it was Stoichkov on the left and one of the defenders. Was Stoichkov, good. Stoichkov was amazing in this match, you know. He certainly was, yeah. yeah. Stoichkov plays it in. And goes down the touchline. He plays it in back, back diagonally. The defender gives it to him diagonally. So they've played a one-two, advancing something like 40 or 50 metres. And then Stoichkov slides it in diagonally, looking yes. for the run of Laudrup. Yes. And Laudrup just fails to make it. But I remember watching that and think, thinking, wow, you know, I haven't been seeing too much of that in the, in, 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 in the old English first division. A move as, as simple as that, but as, as well, it, it, a lot of football is geometry, is, is opening up angles that's, between... That's when you start understanding football, you know. Um, yeah. If you do have an understanding of basic geometry, I would even go as far as to say it's algebra as well. But an interesting thing, on the Brazilian Shirt Name podcast, as we always say, we look at an iconic game. As you're talking here, I'm hearing the different resonances of this game. So we've explained what this the match itself had, but because it was so successful, you've got uh, Silvio Berlusconi looking on, as we mentioned in previous podcasts yeah. as well, thinking, hang on a second, I can, I can make this even more successful, this yeah. uh, European uh, tournament, even more successful than it is, and we'll sell it to TV and everything like that. It's going to go absolutely ballistic. At the same time, as you mentioned earlier, Italian football was our real connection to European football because it was the first European football that we saw on a regular basis on our TV through Channel 4. But this is this match seems to be where there is a change of the guard. OK, uh, uh, what, six years earlier, uh, was it six years earlier that Spain had the World Cup, didn't it? Um, and... The Spanish football has successively been eating into the Spain, dominance. Spain comes into the the European Union this year. At this point, okay. Yeah. So yeah, this is long after Franco. Obviously, that was, that was, yeah, that was huge for them. Uh, on, I said I was in Barcelona at the start of 1990, and uh, I think Sport, Portugal came in, came in as well. Mm -hmm. And it, it's the moment when 
they, I think, consider themselves full Europeans when both Spain and Portugal throw off totally the Franco Salazar, you know, dictatorships and become like full Europeans. So it, it was huge for them. I remember being in, in Barcelona and they weren't, they weren't actually into Spain at all. They were into Catalonia and Europe. You know, Spain could go fuck off, really. It was, it, it, it was their region and the big region. Yeah, yeah. And and there's another resonance as well, of course, because as you again mentioned earlier, uh, this is the first uh, European title that Barcelona have won, European Cup, straight Champions League that Barcelona have won. Their big rivals in Spain, of course, Real Madrid have won about six at this point. Yeah, and won all of the first ones. And, 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 yes, and so yes. Barcelona have been chasing them and chasing them and chasing them. Ever, this, ever since. Is this the changing of the guard there? Is this where they start catching them and catching them well, and catching them? It, it's when they start moment? believing that, that winning is possible and, and it, it's when they become a huge club, not only for what they symbolise as the resistance to Franco and so on, but also for, for what, they, what they, they do on the field. Okay, well, let's look at what we were doing on the, in the music charts that you loved so much. Um, uh, let's you know, love so much, but you know, well, liked more than I expected. Right. Yeah. And, and I, there, I, there's one record, which I think we'll come to later, which I think is one of the all time great singles. Oh, there's a couple of crackers in here. Don't get me wrong, but I'm saying all in all, you've got a chart here. We're looking at the chart of 17th of May, 1992. Uh, I'm not bothered about the number one KW. No, it's rubbish. Yeah, rubbish. Right. Fact, yeah, you see, we're going down my way of thinking now. Number two, you're going to say even worse. rubbish. It's now, even I worse. I knew you were going to say it, that. It, it, it's it, it's an abomination. It, it's it's now, pollution. I knew what you were going to say. Let's just tell people what it is, first of all. And then just let take me my word for it. it. Let me defend it. Give me a moment. It's indefensible. Uh, it, almost, but hold on a second. Guns and Roses, top of their game, doing a, a heavy version of Bob Dylan's not, not Knocking on Heaven's Door. Now, they give it all the bells and whistles that you would expect from a hard, you know, long-haired, hard metal, not too heavy metal, but hard metal, maybe, or thrash metal uh, band from California, whatever you want to call them. And, uh, yeah, it, it, it is annoying if you think that song can only be done in a Bob Dylan way. But actually, they they give a new way of hearing the song. Uh, hear, no, you laugh, but that's what they do. They've got a, new, a busker do it for the, yeah, the, yeah. the, the, the three and million time. <laughs> you see, you're also going to hate on a ragged tip, aren't you? By SL2 at number three. Yeah, I don't remember it. When, I can't remember massive. that one. It was massive on a ragged tip. Uh, Absolutely I don't remember massive. it. Uh, on Vogue, this um, attempt at sort of rekindling, uh, I suppose you would say the Supremes, but uh, they were a four-girl group out of, uh, well, they were based in California, but they came from all over the place. On Vogue, they started off with this hold on... Um, I can't remember how it goes now. But this, um, you're never going to get my love. And you're never going to get it. What do you think of it? I think it's got a nice funky edge to it. Yeah. But it's all manufactured. Think, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, th I think yeah. it's passable. No more than passable. Okay. Uh, where, right. do you, where do you want to go after that? Um, we could go to CC Peniston, keep on Yeah, walking. I love it. I absolutely Beautiful. love it. I yeah, love it. You see, I love I it. I love it. There's some good tunes there. I love it. Uh, and I've forgotten how much I love it. Uh, it when I was listening to this last night it just carried me back uh, I don't know what I'm not very good with all these little subgenres. was this like swing beat was that what they were calling it at the, at the time yeah it kind of is yeah sometimes they used to call it uh, Harlem swing as well um, yeah it kind of is uh, yeah, a swing beat is more kind of Bobby Brown in particular at that time. But yeah, it, it is. Kind I, of, yeah. I love the production. I love the the sax sound on it, the bass sound on it. You know, it, it just brought back because at, at this time I'm just a few days short of being 27. Is there a better time to be alive? And listening to that brought back so many memories. I must have danced to that. You know, many. You know, and uh, it just sounds fresh. It, it sound it sounds alive. So I, I loved reconnecting with uh, with that song. Yeah, um, for me, there's one or two songs in this chart that I really love connecting with as well. I'm so pleased 
to see good mate of mine, actually, Don E at number 19 with Love Makes the World Go Round. He is, I guess, the closest um, the UK has to a homegrown, uh, not Stevie Wonder, but he's a musical genius, you know, Don E mm-hmm. can play everything. And he writes beautiful songs, as you can hear. It's never quite worked out for him, but uh, he is. Uh, did, did you like that? Yeah, I'd, I'd forgotten that one as well. I, I didn't listen to that one last night, so um, I'll, I'll give myself a kick up the backside for that one. And uh, props to Mark Allman for coming out big showbiz business. Do you like great that song? It's a great, it is, great it? song. The days oh, of Pearly so Spencer. Glad. I it's thought we were going to have song. to fight. I we were no, to fight. I, mean, I think that there's a few like, I mean, this song. This is a kind of mid '60s burlesque coming out of Northern that's the Ireland. That's way he does it. Yeah, that's so, the way yeah, he does and, it. Yeah, and it, his version works beautifully. And it, it, it's there, there's one or two like storytelling songs in this chart. <laughs> Days of Pearly Spencer isn't necessarily a storytelling song, but it's a real mood yeah, song. Yeah. And I think his version is great. It's imagin- imaginative. So I, I really, really in, in, enjoyed that. Yeah, uh, it, 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 it isn't morbid. Um, and you expect Mark Orman to go this sort of dr- drama, over-the-top, dramatic uh, way in any case. He, he's a theatre singer. Yeah. Um, as much, you know, he needs a little bit of drama with him. Uh, Thomas Dolby came and went, not bothered about that now. I, I liked some of his stuff. At uh, the time, I, but still? I, like, I, I, think, I thought it was funny when she blinded me with science. was was yeah. funny. Uh, yeah. I like hyperactive. Mm. I like to scare myself. This one, Close But No Cigar, the only thing that's memorable about it is that is, is the title. Apart from yeah. that, I, I don't think it, I don't think it really works. Right, yeah, it, it, certainly not on re, in retrospect. Joe Cocker though, at number twenty eight. Now that the magic has gone, yeah, great singer. Um, it's a not few, bothered? No, not, not really. That. Not bothered. Okay, no, well, skip over that maybe a bit too late in my. Yeah. I yeah. love his version of uh, of uh, feeling all right. You know the traffic song. Uh, for me, it's the def- it's the the definitive version. Really? My, yeah. Well, he, think, the, he, he does it better than traffic. I think so. Yeah. yeah. No he, way. He, well, because he, he just sings it so well, and he he really blueses it up, and I think yeah. it's great. But but the traffic version is the definitive version. I mean, not for not me, for you, no. not for you, no, but for no, I'm going everybody with, I'm else. With, it is. I'm going with Joe Cocker. Yeah, yeah. Fair enough. <laughs> uh, and the beat, beat Masters number forty three. I knew them lot actually. They were like. Yeah. Um, well, you you wouldn't like it because it's like house producers, I suppose, uh, from Crouch End and got into the charts. And it was funny at the time when we were all going out raving. So I'd go to exactly the same parties as they'd be going out. There were two guys and one girl, actually, is what I remember. Or she was really a girl, a young woman, probably about the age of 18 at that time. And uh, they were putting all these beats together. This was a time, this is why I particularly don't like this time because there was a music called house that came out of chicago um and not to be confused with garage but or garage whatever you want to call it but house music did have a moment at the very beginning where it was the punk of the oh, yeah. club scene of the yeah. club scene yeah, yeah. I, I went to Chicago at that time, so I was at DJ International. I met all the guys. It was like in the punk days, mm-hmm. like just an ordinary guy you know, put together this it was, thing. It, it was really do it yourself, wasn't it? It was do it yourself. That's exactly what I'm looking for, yeah. And um, by this time, it had become, as punk had, yeah, punk when it was sort of morphing into new wave, Basically, New Wave was the uh, the establishment uh, taking over the uh, DIY aspect of punk and putting it back where they felt they could sell it and where they felt it belonged, which was within the confines of a construct. And this is what happened again. The construct is, never mind the music, get a couple of producers together. Uh, or a couple of you know friends together, call themselves producers, work on a beat, because you could know, do it so easily on the keyboards yeah. and with all the new software and everything mm-hmm. like that. Work on a beat, get some singer, you know, not always a black, young black female, but invariably it was, yeah. and um and sell sell the um uh the copyright or the uh, distribution rights 
or sign a you know deal with a label for it because at the beginning just like with punk the labels got caught out that they didn't have any house yeah. of their own they just got, so got caught do out. you think it became too formal eight too soon and then it becomes a little bit like say new new wave cinema a camera in your hand and an idea in your head and people then started doing it without the idea yeah totally and it just became shit there was too much of it it, yeah. it became too easy to sell an idea to record companies. Yeah. You know, what wasn't even a finished product, but it was just like two kids playing on a little stylophone or something like that, going ding, 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 ding. Have a nice, pretty girl uh, fronting it and everything. And then, you know, record company gives you 10 grand for that. On, on the on, other man. side, I mean, the, the thing that actually surprised me, even like people I don't particularly like necessarily, but there's an element of self expression. Uh, say Shakespeare's sister, yeah. who were uh, in there with I don't care, and I don't particularly like it, but mm. you could feel it was it was it Siobhan out of Banana Rama, yeah, 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 that, that this is what she really wanted to do. Of course you know, it she, was. she jumped through the ho- the hoops that was Banana Rama. Now she's doing what she wanted to do, and I think that came across. Um, the Levelers, fifteen years, and I don't particularly like it, mm-hmm. but there is a. The, the, I, I like the ideas behind it, and there mm-hmm. is an attempt to make a kind of new English folk music, which I think is, is, is interesting. And it, it's, it's self-expression. Um, KD oh. Lang, Constant Craving. Oh, it's just, a, just an unbelievable, brilliant song. Absolutely it's a great brilliant. song. But before you get to KD Lang, I've got to give a big shout. For, my, for me, the standout tune in this chart is at number 46, Arrested Development with Tennessee. Yeah. Well, th- th- this is, is the, I said, there's one of the all-time great singles, and we're going to leave it till, till because there's one or two points I want oh, to make before, oh, before we one. have this argument. Okay. Yeah. Go on. Um, Go on you make your point. Then. Little point is... Uh, we're not going to have an argument with this one, not with Tennessee. No, but we may have an argument with a subsidiary point that I want to get into. Okay. Um, number 14, <laughs> right, it said Fred. Oh, my goodness. Uh, I bring this up because this is a big memory of mine from 1992. Yeah. It was a big mate of mine. I was sharing a flat sharing a flat with her. Mm. And I remember her once at around this time saying, you know, I think they're really sexy. And I said, Rach, look at her. They're bald, man. You know, <laughs> no, I don't no. care about. What do you mean you don't care about that? So I thought, no, I've got to do something about this. I have to. I have to. You know, I've got to step in. And 1992, around this time, I set her up on a blind date with another mate of mine. They are still, to- <laughs> they are still together now, and they oh, have a kid. And he and still have doesn't have any hair. No, he has hair. I fixed fixed her up with someone with hair in order to save her. Oh, I thought you were going to teach her a lesson by fixing her up with somebody uh, who didn't have it. Oh, okay. When my time comes before the pearly gates, Hmm. I might just get through based on that. I think that's that's my that's my my, my biggest claim. No, 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 you think I'm you think it's all over? No, for no, no. Me. I, I think you could. Fair you enough. Know, if you're no, going to no, banish me to an eternity of of, of, you're, of, of you're torture, ahead of me. fair enough. You are ahead of me, mate. In those <laughs> pearly gates, believe me. I think they've got another uh, metal gate there after they let you in to double lock it. But, um, and can we just talk about San Etienne as well? Because sure. they're 26. Join our club. I never really understood them. But me neither. Me neither. There's, there's one of their tracks. I think it's a little bit earlier than this. It's called uh, "Nothing Can Stop Us." Yeah, yeah. And I, and I fucking love it. And I think the video is one of the greatest things ever. Mm, uh, it's just magnificent. Mm. And what, what they've done for, for for that song. That, that she's just walking around Trafalgar Square and going into uh, St. James's Park and being filmed with flowers. But it's got this real London feel to it. Oh, I, w- I watch this video when, when, I, when I get homesick. Yeah. Um, but what I feel, that there's some kind of, it, it's all, and especially like this one, Join Our Club and some of their other stuff, it's all kind of a bit fey. There's a bit kind of, there's a, you know, like a distance between a performance. And, and is it, are we supposed to take things ironically? I've never, never been down with that. You know, I'm, I'm not a subtle person. So I've always been a bit confused by them. Yeah, um, I, t- some of these groups I don't get at all. Uh, they passed me by, or I just wasn't in the right place at the right time yeah. to, to, to get them. There was so much music going on outside uh, in the club scene and so on. And uh, particularly in this, you see, for me, one of the reasons why I don't like this uh, chart so much is this chart is coming about at the heyday 
of dancehall reggae. I mean, dancehall right. reggae dominates the scene for about five years. From about... I just remember spending a lot of time this year listening to Substitute Lover by Half Pint. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a dancehall tune. Uh, yeah. Half Pint, remember, he broke onto the scene with that. Greetings I bring from Ja to all ragamuffin. Uh, it was such a boom tune. He took an old rhythm, we call it the heavenless rhythm in reggae. It's one of those old Studio One rhythm. Do 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 you wouldn't believe how many times that baseline has been regurgitated in uh -huh. different formats, slowed down, speeded up. So half pipe's version is a really fast version. Do 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 right. greetings I bring from Jack. Whereas if you take um a, a, another version of it by I mean Dennis Brown does a wicked version of Heavenless. I can't remember uh, what to your love is has got a hold on me. Do 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 much sexier and slower. That's one of the big tunes. Anyway, I can't believe uh, maybe I was living in a parallel wo world because everybody I knew in London at least at this point. Um, maybe outside London, they were all living in a parallel world because we were all listening to dance hall at this point, you know. Genuinely, it was it was the music at the time. And it killed what was, you know, uh, roots rock reggae, but it was so inventive, so humorous. It brought with it a lifestyle of its own, which, yeah, I profited from in a way because this was the backdrop uh, the cultural backdrop to a lot of the books I published at the time mm. but it was such a invigorating time to be around you know Brixton and so on at a time when people were just and it was black and white I mean genuinely right. every I mean though the the at but that's time, what all the house people and the the, the Detroit techno people that's where when they, they come from that's yeah, they but when, when they come across, they just couldn't get over this black and white thing together. You know, it's yeah, why Joe Smooth wrote true. Promised Land, because he'd that's seen true. England. Yeah, that's absolutely I, I, I interviewed Joe Smooth as well at DJ International. I uh, remember being very fondly as well. And um, I can't remember all the rest of them that were there, but Joe Smooth was definitely but, there. He just bought an Alfa Romeo, just for those who want a little bit of anecdote. But the, and the, the one that I bought from this is Tennessee. And... I couldn't stop listening to it uh, during the Keith Floyd thing. Mm. Uh, I, George I just think Floyd. It's, you mean George, George Floyd. Floyd. Sorry, sorry, yeah. Okay. Uh, I just think it's just an unbelievable record. You know, walk, walk the roads my forefathers walked, climb the trees my forefathers hung from. Mm. Fucking hell. You know, it, it gets so deep into the pain and the journey of the black American. Uh, I, I think it's... I think it's almost, it's almost perfect. You know, it's an unbelievable record. It, it does. It takes hip hop somewhere else. It takes it to the rural communities. Um, I've got an elder brother. My oldest it, was brother. that was that true or was that that contrived their ruralism? Um, it's not contrived, but remember, rural America ain't necessarily a million miles away from urban America. So, for example, I was just about to say, I've got an older brother who lives in Houston. When he, I mean, he takes me on a ride to visit friends. Some of them are living out in what looks rural to me. Right. Uh -huh. It looks rural, but that's just, you know, a part of uh, Houston or a part of the suburbs to, of Houston or whatever. But no, no, they are rural, but obviously they were kids who had gone from rural communities or their grandparents were in rural communities, but they'd gone to college and all of that. Um, I can't remember the name of the first guy. He had a nickname, one word nickname, Skip or Sketch. Headliner? No, no, Headliner, I challenge you to a game of horseshoe. A game <laughs> yeah, of horseshoe. Yeah, 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 yeah. But that's what they played. You see, yeah, one of them was called Speech. That. Speech, that was it. Yeah, yeah. He, he's the main man. Speech, that was it. Gosh, uh, thank you for that. I was, I was worried that my memory was going. Mm -hmm. The speech, he was brilliant. I mean, he put together this sort of. This was the, the time when hip hop and hip hop is still in that phase 
where it's not a solo artist format. Right. I was so but, ambitious. I was so optimistic for it at this time uh, with, what, too, what, with what they were doing mm. and with the, the mixture with jazz. Well, uh, and, the, the real mixture with Arrested Development, I thought you'd have picked up on this, is with your hero. Oh, no, Sly Stone, yeah. Exactly, yeah. okay, yeah, yeah. with everyday people. You see, yeah. when they got deep like this politically, it didn't do everyday people was number one for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. You get heavy political like that, and the record company's like, nice tune, but you know, what happened to the I'm everyday people? But this lyrically, aesthetically, is a much cleverer uh, sonically and rhythmically and um. Um, you know, syncopatingly, it's mm. the syncopation actually yeah, that yeah. makes it for me with the rest of the development. And Tennessee is the best thing that they've done. Uh, There's one me. subject I've, I've, <laughs> here is where we start offending people, on, but why not? Go. You know, um, it's the thing I don't understand. It's the Stockholm sy the syndrome of it, because what he's doing in this song, which I, I know, love, I know where you're going. But he's claiming that he's enlightened oh, and I know. so many of his people are not enlightened, but it's all like to the Lord, the Lord, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. and I've never understood this about the black American. I understand that when they were enslaved, they came over and they're, they're separated from their linguistic units deliberately. Mm -hmm. And so there's a word I learned over here, uh, syncretism. You know where, where obviously, where you know that they are continuing to worship their African gods through Christianity, and that that that's the way that they can do it. But then, fast forward that for centuries, and and the African element, it's there in the music, but it's not there in the ideology anymore. And that they like, how on earth? When I saw Denzel Washington give a speech to students who are graduating. And he ended it with, you know, and the most important thing, put God first. What the fuck does that mean? You know, you because this God that they're talking about is the God of enslavement. And you can't get away from this. You know, you can find passages in the Bible which are open to an anti-slavery interpretation. You can't find any direct condemnation of slavery. And you can find plenty of things which are direct incentives to slavery. I mean, the, the law of Moses, which Jesus declared as perfect, is basically a slave owner's guide to the galaxy. It's how to be a slave owner. And even in the, in, in the New Testament, when Paul, who's the inventor of Christianity, really, when he separates it from a Jewish context, there's, there's Paul saying to slaves, be good slaves to your masters, especially if your master is Christian, because then you partake in, in, in their glory. So you're getting from that. First of all, that slavery is, is permissible. There's no commandment against it. Secondly, that Christians can have slaves. Uh, and so I've never understood the attachment that, they've, that the black American has had to this religiosity in on this, this was the point that Malcolm X often made. You know, it's a slave, it's a slave owner's religion. Uh, and I don't think that they've broken from that sufficiently ideologically. Uh, and uh, this has always worried me and troubled me. And I'd, I would love your thoughts on this. Well, you mentioned Malcolm X. I'm going to take it backwards. And uh, you mentioned Malcolm X there. Malcolm X was one of the most religious. Uh, men, political men that uh, we witnessed in the 20th century and he believed in God the very God when you, you say you don't understand why uh, a, a black man turns to God or mentions God but remember when but he um, rejected the Christian God didn't he? he said this is the God no, of the slave owner yeah, but it doesn't matter which God but I'm just saying it's God I mean do, do, do you really think if you believe in God, one God, if you're monotheist, you know, there is a Christian God and then there is a Muslim God and then there is a Judaic God and then there's a... No, if you, if you believe in God, one God, then whoever says that they've got a version of that, yeah, it's still the same God, ultimately. And Malcolm X repeatedly tells you about the similarities of... Um, um, 
passages in the Bible or characters in the Bible with characters in Islam as well. No, the, mm. the, the Quran is taken out of, of mm. the old, and some, yeah. some people would actually see the, 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 the Islam religion as a, as a, just a branch of Judaism. Well, yeah, people see, you know, people can interpret all these things in different ways. And uh, the religions of the, Abraham, the, the, there's, you, there's far you, more. You can say that, yeah, about Christianity as well and bits of other religions as well. Sometimes there is a difference of opinion. Is Christ the Messiah or not? But there's a difference of opinion. Now, given that there is if you believe, if you have faith, because this isn't really about faith, isn't it? It's not necessarily uh, believing in some old geezer with a white beard um, somewhere in the sky. It's not necessarily about that, but it's about faith, about faith in humanity and creation, if you like. You know, I'm, I'm not saying it's not about God, but I'm saying it is about faith. And, um, and I'm just giving you this uh, about my opinion. When um, th there's that old song, which I was quite conflicted about for many years, I was conflicted, uh, not least because uh, Boney M did it for my generation, you know, but many rivers of, mm -hmm. uh, by the rivers of Babylon, where we sat down and then we, um, wept or whatever when we remembered Zion and he said the wicked took us away captivity and required from us a song. a song yeah now when you hear that you think how did you hold it all together it was through faith the rivers of Babylon is the stream, if you like, the metaphor, the stream of your faith, where you sit down and you're strong again and you sing um, uh, songs of praise and joy and so on. Anyway, let me go back to it. So in part of the fabric of um, black communities, uh, African communities, whether they be in the Caribbean, in North America, United States and Canada, or in Africa itself, or anywhere else in the world, indeed, they do have a strong faith connection. Not all of it has been brought in um, through colonialism and enslavement, because, of course, they had faiths before that, mm -hmm. and including monotheic faiths as well. But it, uh, all of it was destroyed to be replaced by, yeah. you know... Uh, um, a white guy essentially with a white beard yeah. and I'm, I'm saying when you're thousands of miles if there's a connection between the faith that, that seeps through the vein of your culture and what you're being offered yeah, I can understand that people think yep yeah, okay fair enough and maybe it's not quite that but either way the um, the uh, particularly up to the mid uh, 20th century uh, faith belief in god belief in god belief in better belief in justice you know justice is part of the faith experience and all of that um, and can be a revolutionary uh, experience as well faith it can be if you look at it in that way but anyway that has been part of what has kept us together because a crucial part of uh certainly during enslavement and when i say kept us together i'm talking about people of african heritage who were enslaved in particular because during enslavement the one connection that we had it was only through um faith and uh the church is it right to say the church certainly people of faith who um, rebelled against uh, enslavement and also connived to, um, uh, to support enslaved people who wanted to leave their bondage. They were people generally of faith, Tim. You know, they were the people that you were 
that were supporting the black struggle. And at some point or other, you know, they went different ways, etc. But they were of faith. Marcus Garvey, when Marcus Garvey comes up in the early 20th century, his motto is one God, one aim, one destiny. And this is the person who many people regard is the father of Pan-Africanism, the revolutionary movement of that. But whether he believed in that 100% or not, or used it as part of the tool to recruit, he had the biggest um, following of any black leader at the time. You know, it was a million people following Marcus Garvey, uh, United Negro Improvement Association, but he knew that he couldn't exclude that part of the black experience. It is part of the black experience phase. If you want to reach black people, even till today, mm -hmm. you know, I can assure you that if you want to reach the black middle classes, go to the church. <laughs> That's where a lot of them are. I'm not saying all of them are there. It's not, you know, uh, a, a sort of a universal in that sense but i'm saying that's where a lot of them are you, you want to go to you know uh see a black leaders they're not all there but a lot of them are there in the church and there is still this bond and it lessens with all societies from generation to generation for all sorts of reasons but that bond is it i get it I, I, I i'm surprised when i don't hear it i'm like whoa have we got somewhere without telling me, you know, that uh, <laughs> we, we ain't on that God thing anymore, man. We ain't on that God thing anymore. Uh, please let me know, folks, if we ain't on it anymore. Yeah, I'm talking about in the black community, but I, I, I do get it. So don't feel away. I'm not the most religious person there is, but I don't fight it. I don't sort of think, oh, somebody is religious and throws it on a record therefore i switch off the record no some of the best music there is as you know is gospel music gospel yeah. and we sit there all the time we love it we don't ever say what the fuck is, is she praising god for you know we never say that so why with hip-hop and i think gospel i mean if you want me to take it really deep really really deep it was the church that sponsored well the church was one of the sponsors. Um, in many respects, it was the porters, the black porters on the Pullman coaches in American mm -hmm. railway companies, these luxury coaches that only ever employed black porters. That's all good because it built up the black middle class. You know, you were able to get, that was the closest thing uh, America had in the 20s and 30s to uh, black middle class with these Pullman porters. You read up about them, it's fascinating. And they surreptitiously funded Martin Luther King in his, uh, in fact, they, they connived, if you like, with uh, the church is a fantastic book about this actually that I can't remember what the name of it is it's called Pullman Porter something or other but um, <clears throat> I with the church to find a young black preacher who could think, move the civil rights movement but, forward but from from an economic point of view the importance of the church is obvious it is the black middle class that have no dependence on the white world so they have complete independence they're not dependent like um, king and king's king's father no he has his parish that's that's his living in the black community he's not dependent on the white world for anything oh, be, and that, be, be careful when you say that because they were black communities that weren't dependent upon the white world for anything. They had their own black banks and had their own black mayors. Yeah, they but were the, the church gives they you a give, gives you a pulpit. It gives you a, a, a photo. The churches were bombed as well, weren't they? Right, yeah. The, yeah. But, but, it, but it gives you a focus of leadership. The, so the, for me, it, it's no surprise. These that black the churches, churches were bombed from the air, Tim. They were bombed from the air. You know, the planes had only just been invented. They were bombed right. from the air. This is the only time the American, I mean, mainland, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, um, and arguably, you know, the ships off Pearl Harbor as well, but the American mainland, the only time it's been bombed from the air, if you exclude 9-11, you might describe that as a bombing. But the only time previously was bombing these black communities. So I think they weren't naive 
uh, about excluding themselves. They knew that came at a price. And I don't think that was necessarily the ultimate goal. It is for Garvey and it is for the Nation of Islam. And, you know, if you see somebody saying separatism, essentially, um, you're, you're going to find it amongst the Garveyites and, and so on, more likely. But the middle class uh, church goes, the Baptists like Martin Luther King and all of those people, you know, they know Martin Luther King, the moment he started marching, he knew exactly that he needed to work with white folks. He knew exactly that. And, you know, you see those early marches, one or two white folks there already, you know. Um, well, it, I mean, it's, history is such a fascinating thing. And the, the what I've enjoyed about this podcast, as well as talking about this great European Cup final, and I would urge any uh, listeners of the Brazilian Shirt Name podcast to go and have a butcher's at it if you can find it. 20th of May, 1992, Barcelona versus Sampdoria, 1-0 to Barcelona in extra time and all of that. Yeah, Ronald Koeman, but you knew that would be the way that the story goes. Uh, the fascinating thing for me, Tim, is just that a beautiful game of football took us to some deep, deep places. How many and podcasts start at Wembley on May the 20th, 1992, <laughs> and end up with a, a pan-African sense of relig religiosity? Well, and more importantly, how many podcasts can say, I was there at that iconic <laughs> match, you know? They can but I wasn't, I wasn't there it. in no church. <laughs> <laughs>